dalle vicende della vita che Roma abbia detto la sua parola Immediately after the surrender, a small protective group was established at al Agala, with patrols out for 40 miles along the coast towards Sirte. The campaign had been a remarkable success. The 13th Corps, as the Western Desert Force was renamed on January 1, 1941, had never exceeded 31,000 men. Between December 9, 1940 and February 7, 1941, it had advanced more than 500 miles. They had captured more than 130,000 prisoners, about 400 tanks, nearly 850 guns, and thousands of wheeled vehicles. The 13 Corps' own losses were about 500 killed, 1,373 wounded, and 55 missing. The launching of a battleship is a sight to quicken the pulse of every Britisher. The King and Queen, accompanied by Mr. Churchill, make their way up the ramp leading to the platform amid tumultuous cheers. Lying on the slipway, in a maze of chains and steel horses, is the naval recruit. While the christening paraphernalia is got ready, a presentation is made to Her Majesty of a bouquet of flowers and a souvenir of the historic occasion. May I also um, to the small <clears throat> now the great floating fortress becomes a living thing as Her Majesty names her. I name this ship Duke of York. May God bless her and those who sail in her. Against the armor-plated bows is broken a bottle of champagne, and the 35,000-ton monster begins her journey down the slipway to the sea. The miles of launching chains run out, and amid the cheers of Britain's shipbuilders, Duke of York glides to her natural element. Mr. Churchill is shy. A ship of majesty and a pride forever. And as their majesties depart, it gives us a grand feeling to know that Britannia still rules the waves. With the destruction of the Italian 10th Army 
and the occupation of the whole of Cyrenaica, the British were faced with a difficult problem. The only Italian forces left in North Africa were five very weak and dispirited divisions of the 5th Army around the port of Tripoli. General O'Connor was confident that the 13th Corps could advance and capture Tripoli with the prospect of eliminating all Axis forces from North Africa, and he immediately drew up plans for doing so. There was, however, another urgent call in a very different direction. After the Greek army had routed the Italian invasion of their country, the German army became a real threat. British resources in the Middle East were insufficient to allow both an advance to Tripoli and aid to Greece. The British High Command decided to send a force to Greece and remain on the defensive in North Africa. Because of the negligible strength of British forces in East Africa, the four months following Italy's declaration of war saw a number of Italian successes. In the Sudan, Italian troops occupied the frontier towns of Kassala and Galabat on July 4, 1940, and in Kenya they captured Moyala on July 15. Then between August 5th and August 19th, they occupied British Somaliland. By November 1940, the British were able to adopt a more aggressive attitude, though still on a limited scale. By February 1941, they were in a position to mount a large-scale offensive. The situation was also greatly improved by the growth of a considerable patriot movement in Ethiopia. There, native forces organized by Major General Ord C. Wingate and other British officers were increasing rapidly in strength and efficiency. At the time the offensive started, the Indian 4th and 5th Divisions were stationed in the Sudan. In Kenya, the units were more diversely organized and of more varied composition. Of the 77,000 troops in the area, 27,000 were European South Africans, 6,000 Europeans serving in East and West African forces, 33,000 East Africans, 9,000 West Africans, and 2,000 of various nationalities. The British plan called for an advance eastward from the Sudan through northern Ethiopia to Eritrea and the Red Sea, together with a nearly simultaneous advance northward from Kenya through southern Ethiopia to the capital, Addis Ababa, and also eastward from Kenya to Italian Somaliland. The terrain in many parts of this area afforded a striking contrast to the western desert. Much of Ethiopia is mountainous with wide and torrential rivers. The country favors highly trained troops, and it also gave the Ethiopian guerrillas an advantage. The British offensive started early in February. Progress was rapid, and the various columns inflicted heavy losses on the Italian troops and took large numbers of prisoners. By February 25th, forces from Kenya had captured most of Italian Somaliland, including the ports of Kismayu and Mogadishu. A force from Aden, escorted by warships, landed at Berbera on the coast of British Somaliland on March 16th. On April 6th, Addis Ababa was occupied. Meanwhile, forces from the Sudan captured Karen Eritrea on March 27th, and by April 4th, the area between Lake Tana and Addis Ababa had been occupied. Masawa was occupied on April 8th. On May 16th, after stubborn fighting, the Duke of Aosta surrendered at Amba Alagi with the formal surrender occurring on May 20th. Organized resistance ended, but isolated detachments continued to fight for some months. And it was not until November 27th that Gondor, the last place to hold out, surrendered. The two most important battles of the Eastern African campaign were those fought at Karen and Amba Alagi. The British land forces were well supported by the Air Force. Typical of this assistance were the attacks made by the South African Air Force on the airfields at Addis Ababa on April 4th through the 6th, when about 30 Italian aircraft were destroyed. In East Africa, as in other campaigns, the Italian army had not done well. The campaigns in Africa, as well as the one against the Greeks in Albania, 
had shown Italian troops were poorly led and trained. They were badly equipped, especially in tanks, and logistically poorly supplied. In Africa, they had been completely defeated in two campaigns by British Commonwealth forces of greatly inferior strength. Over 420,000 Italians, including Italian-trained native troops, had been killed or captured, compared with approximately 3,100 British Commonwealth battle casualties. The Italians also lost hundreds of tanks, guns, trucks, and aircraft, and vast quantities of other equipment and stores. The collapse in East Africa was Italy's third serious defeat since entering the war. By early February 1941, she had been decisively beaten in Cyrenaica. By mid-March, her last effort to defeat the Greeks without German aid had failed. For the British, the campaign in East Africa was the last of the easy victories. Thereafter, they were to meet Germans, who were well-led, well-trained, and well-equipped. After the Battle of Bedefoam in February 1941, the bulk of the British forces in the Western Desert were withdrawn in preparation for the expedition to Greece. The defense of Cyrenaica was then left to the Australian 9th Division and part of the 2nd Armored Division. Later, the Indian 3rd Motor Brigade was sent to the desert as reinforcements. This force, which was much less experienced than the Australian 6th Division and the 7th Armored Division, which it had replaced, was under the command of Lieutenant General Philip Neen. Up to this time, the Germans had participated in the Mediterranean operations only in the air. Since early January, the Luftwaffe had made attacks on British warships and convoys from Italian airfields. The predicament of the Italian forces in North Africa, after their serious defeats in Cyrenaica, convinced the German high command that a substantial force must be sent to the assistance of their Axis partner. The decision to do so had been made on January 11th, and on February 5th, the German Africa Corps was formed. The new corps, which consisted of the 5th Light Motorized Division and the 15th Panzer Division, was placed under the command of Lieutenant General Erwin Rommel. Within three months, German efficiency and equipment, along with Rommel's skill in armored warfare, combined with the reduction in British strength to change the whole position in North Africa. The British were driven back to the Egyptian frontier. Rommel arrived in Tripoli on February 12th and at once began organizing the defenses of the area with available Italian troops. He made plans for offensive action as soon as the Africa Corps arrived. General Wavell and his intelligence staff estimated that Rommel would not be able to stage a major offensive before May 1st. They were wrong. In early March, there were a number of clashes between the opposing light forces in the Al Agala area. Then on March 24th, Axis forces occupied Al Agala and on April 1st, they took Mersa Brega. After this, their advance was rapid. The weak British forces were outmaneuvered and thrown into confusion. On April 3rd, Benghazi fell, and on April 7th, a German reconnaissance unit captured Generals O'Connor and Neen. McKeeley was taken the next day, and by April 11th, Axis forces had reached Bardia and Saloum. In the face of this serious threat to the Suez Canal, General Wavell had decided to hold the port of Tobruk with the Australian 9th Division and the Australian 18th Brigade, along with help from some armored and other ancillary units. Their task was facilitated by the existence of the old Italian defense works on the landward side, which were still in fairly good condition. By April 11th, Tobruk's defenses were finished, but the speed with which Rommel's forces pressed on past the port made it apparent to Wavell that the Axis objective was the Suez Canal. 
it became necessary to make a stand somewhere in the neighborhood of the Libyan-Egyptian frontier. The reconstituted Western Desert Force, consisting of all the troops Wavell could make available, was put under the command of Lieutenant General Sir Noel Beresford Pierce. It comprised the Indian 4th Division, the Australian 7th Division, the incomplete 6th Division, and a mobile force equivalent to a brigade. In the reading room of an RAF hospital, convalescent airmen are putting in a bit of time reading thrillers while temporarily off the active list. In the gymnasium, some of the boys with undercarriage trouble are loosening up stiff landing gear. Only the best is good enough for the best airmen in the world. Those whose wounds are fully healed take advantage of a fall of snow to put in a bit of ground strafing. It's a grand pick-me-up snowballing, but there's another snow fight going on at an aerodrome where planes of a squadron, a gift from the people of Burma, are being refueled and armed in readiness for another spot of bother. They've only just landed, but their pilots come a-running as Jerry is reported in the neighborhood. On go the shoots as these aces of the Burma squadron prepare to go to work. They're big figure men, these. There's Blatchford, a DFC, Stanford Tuck with three decorations, and Flying Officer Martin, each with a record bag and ever ready for more. A flying trio which spells trouble for the Bosch with a capital T. Taxiing downwind across the drome, the three modern musketeers jockey into position and then opening up their throttles, skim across the snow-covered ground and into the air, with 3,000 horsepower engines driving them like rockets at their targets. The fight is on! Between April 13th and 17th, and again between April 30th and May 4th, Axis troops unsuccessfully attacked Tobruk. Meanwhile, British defenses along the Egyptian frontier had been organized, and it soon became clear that this, combined with the threat to their flank from Tobruk and logistic difficulties, had brought the Axis offensive to a halt. Between May 15th and 17th, the British carried out a local offensive in the Halfaya Saloum Kapuzo area. Although this offensive was partially successful, the Germans recaptured Halfaya on May 27th. Meanwhile, on May 12th, a sea convoy, codenamed Tiger, had arrived in Egypt with 82 cruiser tanks, 135 infantry tanks, and 21 light tanks. And this made it possible to start rebuilding the 7th Armored Division. By the end of the month, the British forces had been reorganized and re-equipped sufficiently to assume the offensive. And on May 28th, General Wavell issued orders for Operation Battleaxe. The Western Desert Force was to defeat the enemy on the frontier and occupy the Bardia Saloum Capuzzo Sidi Aziz area, then attack the enemy around Tobruk and relieve the port, and finally move on Derna and Mekili. The forces available were the 7th Armored Division, the Indian 4th Division, the Indian 11th Infantry Brigade, and the 22nd Guards Brigade. Axis forces consisted of the 15th Panzer Division in the frontier area, with three Italian infantry battalions around Capuzzo, and the rest of the weak Trento Division around Bardia. The attack began on June 15th and achieved some initial success, but on the following day, progress was slow, and further advance was checked by enemy counterattacks. By the morning of June 17th, losses in tanks and the generally unfavorable situation made it clear that the attack had failed. The order to withdraw was given, and the British forces retired to their original area. British casualties totaled about 960. Of 90 cruiser and about 100 infantry tanks, which began the battle, 27 cruisers and 64 infantry tanks were lost. The Air Force lost 36 aircraft. 
The Axis forces sustained about 800 casualties, mostly Germans. They had 12 tanks destroyed and about 50 damaged, and they lost 10 aircraft. The British failure in battle axe was attributable to the haste with which it was mounted, the lack of opportunity to train the troops with new equipment, and the lack of tactical training, especially in armored units. Cooperation between air and ground forces also left much to be desired. The Axis defenders occupied well-prepared positions and showed marked skill in handling their anti-tank weapons and in staging counterattacks. It was clear to the British that a much greater effort was required if the Axis forces were to be eliminated from North Africa. The next six months were to be a period of preparation by both sides. Meanwhile, on June 22nd, Germany attacked the USSR. Prime Minister Churchill at once acclaimed the Soviets as an ally with whom his country would cooperate to the fullest extent. The epic story of the Lofoten Island raid. In a corner which is forever Norway, British and Norwegian forces take the Germans completely by surprise, descending on them like a boat out of the blue. Local Quislings, Nazi SA men and Gestapo agents are rounded up for transportation to an internment camp where they can no longer vent their particular brand of venom. Nazi soldiers are also among the prisoners. They're taken aboard blindfolded. They never saw our men arrive and they're not going to see them leave or witness the destruction of Hitler's plundered oil. This is the first opportunity for Norwegians to escape from the vaunted benefits of Hitler's new order. All those who could do so rushed eagerly to take advantage of the opportunity. Oil drums are broken open as the work of destroying German-controlled codfish oil factories gets underway. Huge storage tanks and refineries go up in flames in the harbour of Stansund. Without opposition, in one fell swoop, Hitler loses thousands of tons of precious explosive producing oil. The raid clearly exposes the inability of the Germans to protect their stolen interests. The Foten Islanders walk through London on their way to meet King Haakon of Norway. As the 300 Norwegian patriots assemble, Sergeant Stronholt and a rescued woman relate their experiences. Uh, how do you saw the English first? Well, I heard the, sh the shot. They were shooting and then mm. I was so glad because they were English. We have been waiting for them so long and we never expect them that time. That's <laughs> the Norwegian spirit. King Haakon of Norway arrives at the reception to welcome these men and women. They come to Britain not as refugees, but filled with the spirit of the ancient Vikings as fighters for a common cause. In his address of welcome, the king spoke of the encouraging way his people are behaving under oppression. The men who listen to him have come to join their fellow countrymen in the fight to liberate their country from its loathsome occupants. At the end of his speech, the king and his subjects join in singing the Norwegian national anthem. Lenge live Norge! Long live Norway! It is with profound revulsion that we see what Nazi bombers have again done to the London home of our king and queen. In a recent raid, a salvo of bombs struck the palace forecourt, demolishing the North Lodge. With these pictures as a background, nothing is more gratifying than to repeat that the RAF have since delivered the heaviest attack yet made on Germany, bombing Bremen, Hamburg, and last but not least, Berlin, a fitting prelude to our spring offensive. It must be hell to live in Hitler's country.
On July 5th, General Sir Claude J. E. Auchinleck replaced General Wavell as Commander-in-Chief in the Middle East. It would be hard to imagine a more difficult military task than that which had faced General Wavell during his two years in command. With the entry into the war of Italy and the fall of France, he found himself with totally inadequate forces, imperfectly trained and not fully equipped. He was outnumbered on all fronts. In less than 12 months, he had completely defeated the Italians in North Africa and East Africa and had killed or captured more than 400,000 of the enemy at a cost of just over 3,000 British Commonwealth casualties. These results were attained despite distractions in Syria and Iraq. In April, on political grounds, he was compelled to send a large force to Greece. But in spite of this contingency and the arrival of the German Africa Corps in North Africa, he succeeded in carrying out his main task, which was the defense of the Suez Canal. Those Allied commanders who came to the Middle East and the Mediterranean later never experienced the same difficulties. Their resources in men and materials were incomparably greater. During the summer of 1941, there was little change in the dispositions of either side. Planning for the next British offensive, known as Operation Crusader, began in August. On September 18th, the Western Desert Force was renamed the Eighth Army and placed under the command of General Cunningham, who had earned a high reputation in East Africa. Meanwhile, in July, there were reports of German intrigues in Iran, and on August 17th, a joint Anglo-Soviet note was sent to the Iranian government. British forces from India entered the country on August 25th. There was some resistance at first, but it ceased by August 28th. At about the same time, Soviet forces entered Iran from the north. On September 17th, British and Soviet troops occupied Tehran, the capital. The occupation of Iran prepared the way for the development of a supply route to the USSR. While these events had no influence on the war in the Mediterranean, the denial to the Germans of access to that part of the